Hey guys, Jesse Stokes here. <clears throat> um, so in kindergarten, something really funny happened to me. I was riding on the swing set, and this is a true story. I was riding on the swing set, and at school we had something called Before Care. And at Before Care, um, we were able to just hang out in the playground before school started. It was at a school called ACS, or it's also known as Atlantic Christian School. I went there until fourth grade. But back in kindergarten, one day I was there at Before Care, and I was riding on the swings. And there was a first grader that was hanging out with us. Now, when you're younger, you look at first graders and you're saying, like, this kid is huge. Like, this kid is so much older than me. Because when you're young, like, the age difference between kindergarten and first grade and first grade and third grade is huge. And when you get older, the gap starts to get smaller. But when you're younger, I looked up to this kid and he tells me, Jesse, I bet that you can't ride the swings without with no hands and I said oh yeah and so I began to ride on the swing set and I get higher and higher and I let go with my hands and I said look at me I'm doing it with no hands and he says yeah but I bet you can't go higher and I said oh yeah and then so now I'm going farther and farther back and I start to get to the top and as I'm going forward I start to fly off the swing set and I'm floating in the air with my arms like this, and I put my left hand out to break the fall. I was screaming, and there was a bunch of mulch under me, and I landed on my left hand, and lo and behold, it snapped. I broke my wrist, I fractured my wrist. I started crying, and I was just out of commission, and I was trying to play it cool, but it really hurt so bad. And so I was injured. And after I was injured, I realized that I couldn't continue the rest of the school day, but I needed to get help, okay? Now, when you're in kindergarten, you can't really do too much to help yourself, especially if you can't drive. You see, as much as I wanted to help myself and drive to the doctor's office and walk over to the ER and sign the papers and say, hey guys, my wrist is hurt, can you please help me? I couldn't do anything unless my parents came and picked me up and forced me to go into the doctors because they knew that it was the best thing for me. You see, this is exactly what happens in Mark chapter eight with a blind man who is hurt and has nothing that he can do to get to Jesus, but other people bring the blind man to Jesus. So we're gonna pray, Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for all the blessings that you pour out on us constantly. God, your grace is amazing. Your love is indescribable. Lord, I ask for the power of the Holy Spirit and the clarity and conviction right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark chapter 8, it says this, And the disciples came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Sorry. I had a little outline. I got to get it. I was studying this passage. Um, and in Mark chapter 8, we see right away that Jesus comes to a town called Bethsaida. Now, if you know anything about Bethsaida, there was another miracle that happened here in John chapter 5 at the pool of Bethsaida. And Jesus heals another man. Now we see that Jesus comes to Bethsaida with his disciples. You see, Jesus, even though he was the Son of God, he was the Lamb of God, he was the power of God, he still spent time with his disciples. He spills, still, he spill, he spilled it. He still spent time with his best friends on the planet. You see, he wasn't someone that traveled alone. 
but he walked with his best friends. And you know, Jesus says in John 15, for those of us that know him, he says, no longer have I called you servants, but I have called you friends. You see, Jesus wants to take the journey with us. And it says, some people brought to Jesus a blind man and begged him to touch him. You see, there were some people around the situation, and there was this blind man. Now, this blind man, if you know anything about the Old Testament, a blind person was an outcast of society. They had no place. They had no reputation. They were guilty of blindness, and most people thought that they were blind because of their own sin was causing them to be blind. But it says that some people brought to him a blind man. Now, this idea of people bringing other hurting people to Jesus is not new, especially for the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 2, we see that there's a paralytic, and it says that, that people, it says in verse 4, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had a, and made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, your sins are forgiven. But in verse 3, it says they, they came bringing, or no, sorry, bring him a paralytic carried by four men. So four men brought a paralytic, someone who was paralyzed, who could not walk, to Jesus. And that's how he got healed. And we see constantly that, that sometimes in our faith, sometimes in our journey with Jesus, the body of Christ or the other believers or people that come around us oftentimes bring us or point us to Jesus. Now, this is huge if you're in counseling or if you're trying to help someone to their problems. It's important to take the journey with people. In Romans, it says to bear one another's burdens. So we're supposed to you know, walk alongside of people, but we're ultimately supposed to point them to Jesus, who's the only one who can heal. He's the great physician. He's the best doctor. You see, as much as our wisdom can help people to point them to get alone with Jesus, as we'll see in the story, is the best answer. But it says they begged him to touch him. You see, there was also an aspect of urgency. There was an aspect of yearning. There was an aspect of not letting Jesus go alone without healing this person because they begged Jesus to touch him. They didn't just say, hey, Jesus, can you please do this? But they begged earnestly. You see that begging also is not new. In chapter 7, there's a story of a woman. And it says she begged him to cast out the demon of her daughter and then they continue with the story and because of her faith and her earnestness Jesus then does the healing we also see in Luke there's a parable that says to be consistent and constant in prayer and it gives an analogy of a widow constantly coming to the judge and crying out for justice and the verse says will God not give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night you see God is now our father through the blood of Jesus through believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and in our place and he rose again and you believe that Jesus took on your sin on himself now God becomes our father John 14 6 says that you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And the Father wants us to plead with him according to his promises. He wants us not to just leave life as it is, but know that the Father can help. And sometimes he'll put circumstances in our lives so that we can cry out to him. And you see, there was a blind man, and they knew that Jesus could heal him. You see, this story in Mark chapter 8 is also very similar to the story in John chapter 9 of a blind man. There's a very similar story, and it would be interesting to do a study. I'm not going to do it today, but to parallel these two encounters with how Jesus deals with the blind man. We also know about blindness, that blindness, even though this man was physically blind, the Bible continues in the New Testament to talk about how all of us 
are spiritually blinded. All of us have been blinded by Satan. We've been masked by the devil to not be able to see God clearly. It says in Ephesians, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of obedience. And it says that we were carrying out the passions of our body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And 1 Corinthians talks about how Satan, who's also called the God of this world, has blinded people's eyes so that they could not see. Again, in Romans... Romans 11... says that a partial hardening has come upon Israel. And it says in Romans 1 that when we suppressed the truth about God, which was plain to us, because God has shown it to us, he says our foolish hearts were darkened. Where is it? Sorry. For all know... This is every believer born into sin. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. God says, look, because we did not honor God, Romans 3, 1 says that no one seeks after God. It says that we are all blind. So we can all relate to this blind man because that was once one of us. And maybe that's you now. And it says, he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. You see, this is an amazing thing that Jesus does here. He sees the need and he takes this blind man right by the hand. He walks with him one on one. You see, Jesus came for those who are sick, for those who need help, for those who are rejected, and he takes them by the hand, destroying the culture. You see, Jesus was a master, but he also served. He got down on our level, and he takes this blind man by the hand, and he takes him out of the village. I think this is amazing that he, it says he takes him out of the village because that's exactly what Jesus is going to do with us one day. He's going to take us out of this world and into heaven when he comes to take us to himself. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Jesus tells his best friends, he says, guys, I'm gonna come, don't worry, this world might be tough. Jesus says, in this world, you'll have tribulation, but take heart, take heart, kids, I've overcome the world. And he says, I'm gonna take you up into heaven so that you can always be with me. So Jesus takes this blind man out of the village And I also think that when Jesus wants to meet with us while we're here on earth, even though one day we'll be up in heaven, when we're here on earth, he oftentimes leads us, just like Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, he wants to lead us by his Spirit to an isolated place with him. You see, when Jesus wants to do his best work, oftentimes he puts the world or the village on pause in our lives so that we can just be out of the village and in with Christ. And it says, when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Now it's interesting, it says that Jesus spit on his eyes. 
he spits on the place where he was rejected. He spits on the eyes that were blind. And we have to ask the question, why would Jesus use the word, use spit? Why would he have to spit on anything to do this miracle? Was it the spit that healed him? Now, Jesus did not need to spit on this man to heal him. For there were many times in the Bible where Jesus even healed people without even being in their presence just by saying the word. And he healed Lazarus out of the grave and said, Lazarus, come out, and just cried it out, and bam, resurrection. So why did he spit on his eyes? Well, number one, back in Jewish tradition, they found out that spit was actually considered a healing um, additive, and it was a healing um, process was used in spit. So when Jesus spit on his eyes, he was revealing to the people around him and to the other man that his intentions were to heal. We see in John chapter 9 that Jesus also spits on another blind man and makes some mud pies with his eyes. And it's to show that Jesus can do anything. To show that Jesus, if, I mean, if you study the healings of Jesus, he never heals the same way. It's really a mystery why he would do this. But I know that he didn't need to, to heal him. But he was listening to what the Father told him to do. And so he did it. And he laid his hands on him. Now when I was reading this, I saw um, just kind of a cool connection of the gospel. Now I didn't see it, but the Lord opened my eyes to see this. So it says that he spit on his eyes and he laid his hands on him. And he took him out of the village. And I think of this is just the story. And then Jesus takes, he takes him out of the village, lays his hands on him, and spits on him to heal him. Okay? And now we have Jesus also, who was taken out of the village to be crucified, had hands laid on him to punch him and say, prophesy to us if you're the Christ. And people laid hands on him to hurt him. And then in Mark 10.30, it says that they spit on him. And mocked him and ultimately that was Jesus is sacrifice to die and Jesus does the same sacrifice for this man to live to have spiritual life to be able to see but Jesus was willing to be spit on taken out of the village taken out of um, Jerusalem to be crucified and he says do you see anything and the man's response is this he looked up he lifted up his eyes in John 17, verse 1, Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven before he prayed. And he looked up for the first time ever. This guy's blind. He's looking for the first time ever. And he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. I think that's kind of funny. He's like, I'm, I see people, but they kind of look like trees. You know, he's never seen a person before. He's never seen his own skin. He's never seen his own hand. But now he sees and he can barely see. It's like a faint vision. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. You see, so the amazing part about this is that Jesus opens his eyes. And you see, the first time when he opens his eyes, it says he sees a little bit. But then the second time when Jesus touched him, he saw clearly. But the first time that Jesus touched him and the same time that Jesus touched him were all in one encounter. Now, this is how the gospel works. You see, when we're confronted with our sin and how our sin actually neglects, uh, neglects us from being in a relationship with a perfectly holy God who's perfect and immoral and above us and set apart from us and then we see ourselves and we're filthy we're unclean you see then light starts to go into our eyes we see reality of sin and we see our need for a savior and we start to have some kind of vision of the truth the truth starts to become known to us through the word of god 
But then Jesus lays his hands again on us. And that to me is like when you believe in God. When you believe in God, then the gospel comes in and it lightens your whole eyes. Jesus says the eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. And when you're born again, when you believe on Jesus, then everything is clear. Like it says here, his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And oftentimes, you see, the gospel opens our eyes to see perfectly clear from the first time. But there are often times when we can start to see parts of the gospel, but as we keep presenting the good news of Jesus over and over again, just like Jesus had to lay his hands on him twice, in the same way, when we hear the word of God, sometimes it clicks a little bit, and then another time you'll hear it, and it'll be the same exact message. It'll be the same exact laying on of hands, but then everything will make sense. It doesn't, it's a spiritual, supernatural thing that God does. And his sight was restored. I mean, think about how happy this guy was, everything. And now it wasn't just the people that looked like trees, but everything was now clear. And then verse 26 says, and he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. And Jesus closes the encounter and says, go home, don't enter the village. Now this to me is kind of shocking because you would think that this man wants to go out and tell the whole world. That this man wants to go out and now he sees, now Jesus will send him out like he did with the demon possessed man in Mark chapter five, when Jesus healed this demon possessed man, Jesus tells him to go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And this man, he says, don't tell anyone. Now this happens oftentimes in the book of Mark when Jesus heals someone, he will sometimes and I think most often say, zip it, don't say anything. Because Jesus, it wasn't his time yet for everyone to know. And Jesus works on a different time schedule than us. So what do we get from this chapter overall? We get that Jesus walks with us. Jesus physically touches us and lays his hands on us when we're hurting. We see that Jesus leads us out of the village into heaven, but also with him. We see that Jesus wants to share the gospel with us more and more. And that's his heart. And then we will see clearly if we keep on listening to the truth. And then we see that our perspective becomes clear when we gaze into Christ more and more. So that's Mark chapter 8. Thank you so much.